There's been a lot of instances where the show decided to combine two character stories for a variety of reasons, but usually it's a simplified thing so you don't have new characters introduced in every scene. Remember that moment in season 3 when Arya and the Brotherhood Without Banners meet up with Melisandre? Well this entire thing didn't happen in the books. In the show, Melisandre tells Arya that she has a darkness in her, and in that darkness there are eyes that Arya will shut forever. A very similar encounter happened with a character named the Ghost of Highheart and Arya in the books. The Ghost of Highheart is an old woman that the Brotherhood seek out for her guidance. She's been gifted with the ability to have trusted prophecies. She has an unsettling appearance described as a very old, three foot tall woman with pale skin and red eyes. The Ghost of Highheart gets her name from where she lives. In the Riverlands, there's a large hill called Highheart. Long ago, this was once a sacred place to the children of the forest. A circle of weirwood trees were at the top of the hill, but are nothing but stumps now after the Andal invasion. Highheart is believed to be haunted because of what the Andals did to the children and their trees, so the small folk stay away from this hill. Her real name hasn't been revealed, but she's the same character responsible for having the Mad King Aerys Targaryen II marry his sister, believing the promised prince would be born of their line. When the ghost of Highheart sees Arya, she wants her to leave because she believes Arya is associated with death and darkness. Instead of introducing a new mysterious and complex character for one scene, the writers just decided to give this interesting piece of dialogue to Melisandre to simplify things for more casual viewers. I see a darkness in you. And in that darkness, eyes staring back at me. Eyes you'll shut forever. In that same scene, Melisandre was meeting with the Brotherhood Without Banners to take Gendry for his king's blood. In the books, this happened to a completely different character. This happened to Gendry's half-brother, Edric Storm, another one of Robert Baratheon's many bastards. Edric was never in Game of Thrones and instead just combined with Gendry's story from the books. He lived and was raised in the Baratheon's home of Storm's End. You know that moment in the show when Gendry was leeched by Melisandre for his king's blood? Well, that happened to Edric in the books. Davos saves Edric from being burned alive by Melisandre as a sacrifice by shipping him off to Essos. While all this was happening to Edric, Gendry has been safe working as a blacksmith in the Riverlands. Edric hasn't appeared much in the story after sailing away. All that we know is that he's safe in Lys, with loyal people protecting him. The next two characters who had their stories combined for Game of Thrones is Sansa and Fake Arya. Fake Arya is a character in the books used by the Boltons and Lannisters to legitimize House Bolton's rule over Winterfell in the north. Her real name is Jane Poole and she was a young girl who traveled with the Starks from Winterfell to King's Landing when Ned Stark was asked to become the Hand of the King. She was a very minor character only known for being Sansa's friend. After the Lannisters lose track of Arya, they tell everyone that Jane Poole is in fact Arya and send her off to marry Ramsay to legitimize their rule and keep the northerners from rebelling. So those disturbing scenes where Ramsay was torturing Sansa actually happened to Jane Poole in the books and what she went through was far worse than what they wanted to add in the show. Next is Willis and Loras Tyrell. These two are brothers but the show decided that it didn't need that many Tyrells. Marjorie actually had three older brothers, Willis, Garland, and Loras. While having all these Tyrell children made the story more realistic, I do agree that it does complicate the story considering there are very minor characters. In the show, for a while Sansa believed she would marry Loras and live at Highgarden in the Reach, far away from the Lannisters in King's Landing. And if you were to marry Loras... Well, oh, your place would be at Highgarden, wouldn't it? We would be sisters, you and I. Would you like that? In the books, she was actually meant to marry Willis. Willis, being the oldest son, is the heir to Highgarden. There was a cool bit of lore behind this character. When he was younger, Willis entered a tourney and faced off against Oberyn Martell. This was Willis's first tourney joust and Oberyn was older and far more experienced. Oberyn knocked Willis off his horse, defeating him, but the horse would fall on Willis's leg, leaving him crippled. Since then, he stuck with his books and became one of the most renowned animal breeders in Westeros. After their joust, the two surprisingly have remained friendly with one another. Even that short moment in the show when Loras and Cersei were almost set to marry happened to Willis in the books. I feel like I'm in a dream. <laughs> yes, me too. Definitely. I've dreamed of a large wedding since I was quite young. The guests, 
the food, the tournaments. And the bride, of course. <laughs> Loris will certainly come to know a deep and singular misery. Father doesn't discriminate. When Arya arrives in Bravos, she goes to the House of Black and White to be trained by the Faceless Men. An older man welcomes her, who is revealed to be Jock and Hagar on the show. In the books, it's an entirely new character who doesn't give Arya his name. She calls him the Kindly Man. Jockin was an already established character who was pretty popular in Game of Thrones. Jockin in the books is continuing his assassination work in Westeros instead of being the priest and teacher at the headquarters. This next one is a little complicated. It was revealed in the season 7 finale that Jon Snow's mother actually named him Aegon Targaryen. He's the legitimate Targaryen heir since his parents Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark got married before his birth. In the books, there's this questionable character who goes by young Griff living in Essos. It's later revealed that young Griff is apparently Rhaegar Targaryen's son Aegon, who he had with Elia Martell. Everyone believed he was killed as a baby during Robert's Rebellion. I am the brother of Elia Martell. And you know why I've come all the way to this stinking shit pile of a city? For you? I'm going to hear you confess before you die. You raped my sister. You murdered her. You killed her children. This Aegon is currently invading the Stormlands with the cell swords called the Golden Company. They haven't been at war long, but so far his attempt at becoming king is going smoothly. Jon Snow in the books will definitely not be named Aegon since Rhaegar wouldn't give two of his sons the same name. Instead of introducing young Griff, the show just made Jon Snow the legitimate heir named Aegon. George Martin hasn't written a lot about young Griff, so I'm sure the show writers didn't want to stress themselves by creating a huge side story all on their own, when they already have so much they have to figure out without the books to follow. The man who has been watching over young Griff was someone named Griff. His real name is John Cunnington and was an old friend of Rhaegar's. A part of his story was given to Sir Jorah Mormont. That moment where Jorah jumped into the water to save Tyrion from the Stone Man actually happened to Griff or John Cunnington in the books. Jorah never got Grayscale in the books. This all happened to John Cunnington and he's been keeping it a secret while he tries to make young Griff or Aegon the King of the Seven Kingdoms. That scene where Dario Naharis is chosen as Daenerys' champion outside the Marine Walls happened to a character named Strong Belwas in the books. I was the last to join your army. I'm not your general or a member of your Queen's Guard or the commander of your Unsullied. My mother was a whore. I come from nothing. And before long, I will return to nothing. Let me kill this man for you. Very well. Strong Belwas was one of the best slave pit fighters who would eventually be sent to protect Daenerys by Illyrio. He's a very powerful and skilled fighter who was made one of Daenerys' Queen's Guard. Also in Marine, a couple book characters had their stories merged. After Daenerys disappears on the back of Drogon, Tyrion takes control over Marine in her absence and is rewarded by becoming the Hand of the Queen when she returns. In the books, it's Ser Barris and Selmy who takes control of Marine and is appointed the Hand of the Queen by the people loyal to Daenerys. Barristan has always been more of a fighter and not a diplomat, so when Daenerys finally does meet Tyrion, it's likely he'll also become the Hand in the books. Barristan was killed off early in the show for some reason, so he wasn't even around when all the chaos took place in Marine in Danny's absence. I never liked that decision by the writers, because Barristan has been around so long that he could provide so much backstory and lore for show watchers. In the Tower of Joy flashback, where we see Ned and company fight some Kingsguard members, a few characters had to be merged so this scene wouldn't be as chaotic. I'm not sure I can even classify this one as combining characters, because it's more likely they just cut a couple characters out. Ned's rescue team had a total of 7 members including himself in the books, but had 6 in the show. One fighter was also cut from the Kingsguard side, which is more important than Ned missing a companion. In the books, it was Lord Commander Gerald Hightower, Sir Arthur Dane, and Sir Oswald Went guarding over Lyanna. Arthur Dane is the only one of the Kingsguard named in the show. Sir Arthur Dane? The Sword of the Morning. Father said he was the best swordsman he ever saw. Game of Thrones Wiki names the other Kingsguard member as Sir Gerald Hightower, but he delivers one of Oswald Wendt's lines, so I guess this would be a character merger. In the books, when Ned says that he looked for them at the Trident, Oswald replies, Woe to the usurper if we had been. Now let me play the similar line in the show delivered by the show's version of Lord Commander Gerald Hightower. I looked for you on the Trident. And we weren't there. Your friend, the usurper, would lie beneath the ground if we had been. 
These are just the ones I was able to come up with, so I know there's a ton out there that I missed. You guys can let me know in the comments about any combined character plots you can think of. Thanks for watching.